the darkness when hope was restored? And where was despair when my God split the shores? And where was defeat when the Lord took a breath? When he stood in power by the grave that he left? No. Have you been? 
went to Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace, His power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you understand what it is that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Let's, uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer, and then uh, we'll get to our scripture this morning. Heavenly Father, we quiet our hearts as we approach your word. God, we want to have a, a paradigm where you speak and we respond. So God, as we approach your word this morning, I pray that you would give me clarity. I pray that you would give us all understanding. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're, if you're in Jonah chapter 3, we're going we're gonna to read chapters 3 and 4. I don't know if you guys normally do that. It seems, it seems to me as I've listened to them that, uh, that you do. Don't be afraid of it. They're short chapters. Um, but we want to we wanna cover what we're going to be talking about this morning. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I will tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. And they called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way, And from the violence that's in his hands, who knows? God may relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is this not what I said When I was yet in my country, that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade until till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It's better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. May God bless the reading of his word. This is... I, I I hope you're getting that the story of Jonah is not a story about a fish. Have you picked up on that? Uh, Devin Fox did a, a fantastic job. I, I went back and listened to that. It just did a fantastic job laying out kind of the, uh, the, the groundwork and kind of the overview of the book of Jonah. 
And, and Pastor Ben did a good job last week, too. I also listened to that one. But um, There's a few things that I want to really kind of hone in on, and, and sorry, sorry, if I'm, sorry if I'm shifting all the time. I'm used to having a pulpit, and then it's beside me, and I don't know what to do, but... <laughs> I think it's so interesting when we look at the king, the people of Nineveh, and look at their response to the message. Okay, for, but first of all, but first I, I think we have, to, we have to set the stage about the message and the messenger a little bit, okay? There's not a lot of dialogue here, and so it's, it's hard to kind of get in, you know, it, he, so, he, so he marches into Nineveh and preaches that fire and brimstone, Maybe. Was Nineveh actually three days across? Okay, this is just, just, just bear with me here. Three days to walk across, like that's, that's a big city. Or maybe, or maybe this is Jonah. Yeah, it's three days at that speed, maybe. They traveled a whole day just to get into the city to, to preach his message. <clears throat> I love, the, I love the first thing here in, in verse 1. The Lord says to him, arise, go to Nineveh. Okay, back up. Jonah, just, Jonah got that message the first time and said, nope. Got on a boat, paid the fare, went the opposite direction. God sends a storm. And uh, anyway, I don't have to recap the whole, the whole thing. But, you know, God sends a storm, and uh, the sailors are like, oh, whoa, 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 what's going on? What's going on? Hey, everybody pray to whatever God you worship, okay? All right, all right, that's good. All right, J- Jonah, what are you doing? You know, wake up, you sleeper. Pray to your God. Maybe he'll uh, help us out. And Jonah's like, yeah, maybe. Maybe he will. <laughs> They're like, whose fault is this anyway? And so they cast lots, and then it lands on Jonah, and he's like, yeah, cool, 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 cool. Uh, I might know about this, actually. Um, I forgot to tell you when I got on the boat. Um, I worship the guy that made all this. And, and by worship, I mean I'm running away from him. Um, so, yeah, I, I might know something about the storm. Um, also, I'd, I'd, I'm, I'm not going to do what he asked me to do, so just, just toss me overboard. Just toss me in the water. I'm not, I'm not going there. The sailors try to repent for him. Okay? The sailors turn the boat around and try to go back to land, the direction Jonah's supposed to be going, but you can't repent for someone else. Jonah didn't say, take me back there. Jonah said, just throw me in the water. Throw him in the water, he gets eaten, eaten up by the fish, barfed up on the land later on. <clears throat> I don't even know if he's had time to clean himself off yet. And what is he here? He th- he's got to be thinking to himself, well, that was an adventure. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. Arise. Go to Nineveh. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. He's got to be thinking, didn't, didn't I? Okay, God, you just taught me a really powerful lesson. I won't try to run from you anymore. What do you mean you still want me to go? I, I, I just, I just, I feel this tension where, you know, if you, have you ever, and, I, and this is where I want to apply this part, this part to our lives. Have you ever um, been given a task and not done it until it just didn't matter anymore, and then you never ended up having to do it? I know I have. I learned from my dad that you can make a lot of decisions that way. You make fewer bad decisions, um, but you just kind of don't make as many. I'm not, I'm not reluctant to make decisions. I make slow decisions. Um, but, but sometimes you wait long enough, and it, it, just, it doesn't even matter anymore. And I can't help, help wondering if Jonah ha- maybe thought to himself, well, after that whole detour in the fish thing, uh, you know, with any luck, God sent somebody else. No. No, the word of the Lord comes to, comes to Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh. Just like I said last time, but this time actually, actually go. 
So he goes. You know he's not happy about it. <clears throat> I, I don't want to. I don't want to make it sound like you can't miss out on being a part of what God is doing, because we certainly can. We can have the opportunity to to get involved in what God is doing in our community, in our church, in our. Uh, in our world, you can have that opportunity and sit on your hands long enough and lose the opportunity, okay? So I want to be really clear about that. You can miss out. Because, because actually, see, God wanted to teach Jonah some things and also wanted those, those people to be warned of their destruction. So God didn't let Jonah off the hook on this, eh, pun intended, off the hook, because fishing. But <clears throat> that was weak. You don't have to laugh at that. Um, but in our lives, it is, a, it is an incredible blessing to be part of what God is doing. It's exciting. And, and, and that's, that's something that I, I, hope, I hope, as I talk to people around Lakeland, I, I hope that comes across. And, I, and I, I don't have a lot of early morning meetings. That way my excitement level is higher. But... But, like, it's exciting to be part of what God is doing. I mean, I, I, as, I've, as I'm in talks with these, this, this group that's coming down from the, the church in Pennsylvania, um, you know, we, I'm excited, he's excited, his people are excited. You know, they presented it to their church and had, like, I think he said that, like, 30 people respond. Like, they're not all coming, but you know, some might give, some might, you know, some are going to pray, some are going to help gather materials, and others are going get to get on a bus and come down here. And, and it's exciting. But you know, if we sit on our hands long enough, September 18th is going to roll around and those opportunities have come and gone. And here's an, here's an important thing there to, to acknowledge. God can do his work with or without us. God chooses to work through people. And when God gives me the opportunity... It, to be part of that, when God, when God gives, give me, gives me the opportunity for him to work through me and I choose not to, he can work through someone else. But Jonah didn't get off so easy. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it's, yeah, jo- Jonah could not escape what God wanted to do in his life. And, and, and that's another thing, that when God appoints a season in your life, of difficulty, maybe of suffering. And you know, my mom likes to say, there's no way out but through. And she's right. There's no way out but through. And, and, and rather than, that, we just have this tendency to like, oh, I'm going through a difficult season, so like, if you could just pray for me that it would pass. If you could pray for me that God would take this thing away. Why is that consistent? With, like, do, we want to, do we want to pray consistent with God's will? Why is it consistent with God's will to pray for him to take away the thing that he put in our lives to teach us something? That's easy for me to stand here and say when I don't have a loved one that just got a cancer diagnosis. I don't have a child that was just killed at their elementary school. And so, like, realize that this is easy to talk about. This is real hard to do in real life. But for those of you that are going through those kinds of seasons, and, and I, I'll get my turn. I'm sorry that's part of your story. That you're, that you're having to go through that. And I'll pray for you as you go through that difficult season that you would bear up under it. And that you would, that you would learn what God's trying to teach you through it. And that you would glorify him through it. I think that's a, maybe a better way to say it. You know, some people believe, and I'm not, I, I don't think it matters to the story either way. Some people believe that Jonah wasn't just like swallowed and alive in the fish for three days, but that he drowned, was dead. A fish sucked him up, spit him out, and God raised him back to life. Okay. Well, obviously, we got a problem with chapter two because he's praying um, as he's sinking in the ocean. Um, but, but here's the thing, it's possible, and if that was the case, 
Jonah couldn't even die to get away, to get away from what God wanted him to do. It's like God's, you know, I mean, if that was the case, God, you know, either, either way, he's essentially restored back to life because if you're in the belly of a fish, that is a short-term situation. Um, draws breath again, if nothing else, fresh air again. Hey, Jonah, remember what I told you before? Yeah, we're still doing that. It's a tough pill to swallow when it's something you really don't want to do. I think of, I think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Boy, Jonah thinks he had a tough mission. Another point that, that I want to make here is, is the, it, I alluded to earlier, is the, the, the response of the people is repentance. But Jonah didn't preach repentance, not that, not that we're given here in Scripture. Jonah preached destruction, which was the message that God gave him to preach. Okay, it's not like he didn't say what God told him to say. That was real clear, too, and I think Jonah had learned... Um, even if, you, even if your heart's not in it and you only obey it to the letter of the law, you better do what God said. Anyway, that was what he learned. But Jonah didn't preach repentance, but the people repent. Jonah didn't preach a message that said, yet 40 days in Nineveh will be destroyed unless you repent. And God, the Lord God whom I serve, is merciful and will take away your guilt and pardon you. That wasn't the message. It wasn't this familiar gospel message that we're used to. And yet the response was some level of repentance. Now let's be honest. There is some level to which self-preservation is very much in play here. Okay, If you find out that your, your city is going to be destroyed because of your sin, you want to stay alive. Um, Jonah similarly thought he was doing some sort of self-preservation by not putting himself in the crosshairs by going to Nineveh. But anyway, uh, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that they had a response that ought to be our response in, in that when we're confronted with a holy God to whom we must give an account, That ought to prompt something in our hearts. Look at, I mean, if, if you, I know I'm supposed to be covering three and four, but you know, look in chapter one at the sailors who were, in fact, Jonah's first converts in this book. They've never, it, 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 I was talking with Pastor Michael, and uh, I, I didn't realize that uh, these guys were likely Philistines, not God worshiping, not, not, not the real God. They're praying to, the, praying to their gods and any other gods they may have heard of um, with the hopes that this storm will stop. And when Jonah confronts them with the reality that there is a God who is real, as real as this storm, and it's no joke, like this God made everything, that's what he tells them. I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. Who made the sea and the dry land, and the men were exceedingly afraid. Because wait a minute, like we've been praying to these other gods, but if this God is making the storm, he's real. And if this God is real, he probably expects something of me, and I have not ever prayed to him until just now. They were exceedingly afraid, as they should be. Jonah, that nah, just throw me in the water. Also, I love how he says, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. No, Jonah, the men in the boat fear the Lord, the God of heaven, the way they ought to. You claim to fear the God of heaven. Similarly, I, I call back to that because, because similarly, 
He preaches the, you know, that, that God's going to destroy the city, and the response is, oh, that's not good. Um, we should change. And, and to me, I guess what's powerful about the response is they are not given what we are given. You see, in Scripture, in, in Lakeland every week we read, um, in, as part of our Scripture reading, one of the things that we read is a, uh, a kind of a, a lament over sin, uh, some sort of a, often, often a psalm or, or something that, that acknowledges our sin. And then we always follow that up with an assurance of pardon, which I know sounds real high church and liturgical, um, but Psalm 32. Okay, here's the one they're reading this morning. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. This is Psalm chapter 32. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Skipping ahead here to, to, to verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. In Christ, we're forgiven. And we have all throughout Scripture reminders that our pardon has been secured. If we will but confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from, from all unrighteousness. But that wasn't the message that the Ninevites got. Would you... Would you repent and change your lifestyle if you weren't promised a different outcome? That really challenged my heart this week as, you know, as I've been studying this. Wait a minute, they had, they had no promise of salvation. The king says, who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. He had no assurances of that. He just knew, if there's a holy God and I'm going to answer to him someday, maybe sooner rather than later, i got to redeem what time's left. we got to try. They didn't even have the law. And believe me, Jonah was not about to tell them all the things they ought to do to get right with God. But they responded with repentance without the promise of salvation. And we know here that when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster. Another verse in Psalms, a broken and contrite spirit, O Lord, you will not despise. In chapter 4, we see, but, oh, it's, it's so ugly. It's, it's so ugly what we see. Jonah, I mean, for, obviously, it's ugly the way he responded and was just so, like, um, just didn't have the time of day for these people, was sick to his stomach that God was actually going to save these people. And he was like, he was like, see, I knew it. I knew this would happen. I knew if I came here, you'd end up forgiving him. These are the people, these are the, this is the same people group who have ravaged Israel. They've already come through and carted off half the country as captives to a different city, not to Nineveh. But, you know, and, and so, it's like, you know, and, and maybe, we don't know this, maybe Jonah had suffered personal loss at the hands of the Assyrians. It would explain a little bit about, a little more about his reluctance. They were wicked people. But what I find, one of the things that I find the most sickening is actually not how angry he is that they got saved. Well, it's right there. It's right there with it. He says in chapter 5, Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. 
He sat under it in the shade till he could see what became of the city. Here's what's so sick about that. He, this guy wouldn't even sleep in the city. And not just because it was gross or they were sinful or whatever. No, 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 no. He wanted to make sure he had real good seats to watch God's destruction poured out on this city and on these people. One of the things we don't like to do when we study God's Word because it doesn't handle it well is to place ourselves into it. We, we call that uh, narcissistic <laughs> study of Scripture. You know, let's, let's, let's put myself in Scripture. We like to read, you know, maybe you grew up in a church where the, you'd read the story of David and Goliath, and they'd say, now you're David. Who's your Goliath? That's, no, Jesus is David in that story. Um, but to bring it to our lives, who's your Nineveh? And it's specifically in this, in this category. Yeah, I know, I'm literally doing the thing I said we don't like to do. Um, we picked up on that. But, uh, but I got thinking of it in, in, in my own life. Oh, so here's an example in my own life. Um, you know, we've, we've gone through a lot of effort to, to get to know our neighbors that are right there in our neighborhood. And it was so cool. Pastor Michael and I had a, uh, uh, were, were out, and he, was, he stayed at my house last night. And so we, we, we came back to my house, and the picnic tables in our front yard that we put up for our neighbors were filled with kids. Like all the ki- it was like literally all the kids that, that we knew Almost all the kids we knew from the neighborhood were there. And I you know, went down, high-fived all of them, and knew every one of their names. And I was like, this is so cool. Um, and I told Michael, I said, this is our youth group. They just don't know it yet. <laughs> um, that, that, was, that was really cool. But, but there is a house over on one of the corners of our neighborhood. It's, it's, it's a nice house. They keep it up nicely. Um, nice people. But... Shortly after making any kind of a connection there, um, we saw on Facebook um, that they're very passionate about something and um, in the abortion area, but it's the opposite side of what we would be passionate about on the abortion topic, um, you know, protesting for abortion rights and all these kinds of things, which seems weird when you have kids, but anyway. And it just really brought it to home for me. And it's not, it's, it's not that, like, I walk slowly by that house and, like, you know, wait to see if, you know, fire and brimstone comes down on it. It's, it's, it's not that. It's not that. But it just made me realize, wait, they're, they're, because in my mind, that relationship has a ceiling, and we've probably already hit it, and we've not even really even met them yet. Because we got totally different values. Totally different. And just as I, as I contemplated that, I realized that, you know what, there, there are people groups, and we, we all do this, there, are, there, are, there, are, there can be people groups that we look at and think, they're not neutral, they're on the other team. And boy, I just can't wait for when God comes and sets them straight. Whether that's, whether that's the, you know, those that uh, you know, vehemently campaign for the right to sacrifice our children on the altar of convenience. Or, 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 or maybe, it's, maybe it's those that um, so aggressively push and advocate for all of the, uh, all of the identity issues and want to push that on our kids. I guess what I'm saying is it's easy, it's, it's easy to have the mentality of God's going to judge them someday and kind of have this mentality of like, I'm just going to stand back and like shield my kids from it or whatever, but won't that be, you know, you know what I'm saying? Are you, are you tracking with me on this? There are, there are, that, that challenged my heart because like we ought not view anyone that way. What does Paul tell the church in Corinth? 
He, he, he tells them, you know, all, all of these, you know, all, all of these, it lists off all these evil things. These will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you're sanctified. And, and you know, we, we've received pardon. And man, this, I don't, I don't have time to say everything I want to say about it, but, but Jonah is a lesson in several things. And one of them is religious elitism. Jesus had a lot to say about that to the Pharisees when he got there. Jonah, maybe Jonah was the first Pharisee, I don't know. But, but this idea, God intended for the nation of Israel to be a nation of priests, that, that they, would, they would tell the world about the one true God, that the, that the world would come to knowledge of God through that family, through that nation. And what did they do? They said, that's our God, and he's going to judge you. Rather than he could be your God too. Here's how you can know him. It's easy for us to, to stay in the abstract about that. But, um, you know, it was Jonah's job to go and tell Nineveh, hey, God's going to destroy you. And when they repented, did he then set up, post up in the city and say, okay, just so you know, you made a good first step. Let me tell you some more about this God who has chosen not to destroy you. This God who has worked a great salvation in your lives. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you how you can know him. Let me tell you what he expects of you. Did he do that? No. He went out of the city and set himself up a little tent where he had a really good view just in case maybe God changed his mind and actually did destroy him. You know, the church has a job too. Go. Go preach the gospel. Go, make disciples. Are are we doing it? I I mean, like, are we doing it? Are you doing it? Am I doing it? Not like, yeah, my church is doing this cool stuff. No, are are you? The, The mission is given to individuals. Are you doing it? And to challenge us even further, Are you taking that message of salvation to the people that you think God ought to judge? How about the people that voted different from you in the last election? Should God just judge them or should God save them? How about the people that voted the same as you? Should God judge them or save them? Guess what? That's not an indicator of salvation. And yet, these are are some of the dividing lines that we decide, oh, they're on the, it's good guys and bad guys. No, there's, there's saved people and lost people. That's the only dividing line that there is. Saved people and lost people. And you know what the difference is? Only Jesus. Those of us that are saved are not better than those that are lost. God didn't save us because we were easier to save. There wasn't as much sin that he had to forgive because, you know, we were pretty good. Uh, No, no. Do not underestimate your own capacity for sin. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I want to close with this. If you're trying to put yourself in the story, you could try to put yourself in Jonah's place and be challenged by the lessons of religious elitism, the challenge of reluctance to follow God's, God's um, directives in your life, God's mission. But you know what? Let me put us in a different seat in the story. We're just Ninevites. And Jesus is a better Jonah. We're completely lost without him. And praise be to God that Jesus is the better Jonah. Jesus came 
and took away our sin and made a way for, him, for us to know him. Let's not turn up our nose at the person who hasn't, been, hasn't had that opportunity yet. Instead, let's, uh, let's invite them over for dinner. Let's get to know them. Let's tell them about this great salvation. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're challenged by the story of Jonah. And just when we think we... <laughs> Just when we think we know what our role <laughs> would have been in the story, uh, we realize it's, it's not really that. God, challenge our hearts. Help us to see where hypocrisy and Phariseeism has crept into our lives. Help us to see the people made in your image, loved by you, People you are willing to pardon. Help us to see them. Help us never to have the attitude that, oh, I can't wait till God judges those people. Help us not to look at any lost person and say they're beyond saving. Because we're so thankful that, we, that you did not think we were beyond saving. And we're not better than them. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing it one more time. Let's sing about our living hope.
Salvation be 